five. Gillian Keegan, Secretary of State for Education, literally putting a foot in the concrete, didn't she? Four. Is there a single politician of any party who is concerned about anything beyond the next electoral cycle? Fracking is probably an opportunity which I'd be more keen on taking up than a lot of other people in the Labour Party seem to be. Anyone who tries to claim credit for what happened during lockdown is on a very sticky wicket. We have Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. It's September, the kids have gone back to school, so on cue, the sun's out and we're all trudging around in the very sweltering weather we were all denied during the summer. At what point, we ask ourselves during July and August, does this incessant rain stop being good for the garden? (laughs) Well, it's back to school and back to politics co-pilot as MPs return to Westminster. They've only been back five minutes and already the Tories are in meltdown, this time over the closure of schools constructed using reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete, otherwise known as RAC. Having suffered during Covid, then the teachers' strikes, thousands of school-aged kids are having their education disrupted again, a nightmare for them and their parents. Meanwhile, the Office of National Statistics seems to have got its sums wrong too, announcing that the UK economies actually perform much better than previously reported after huge upward revisions to GDP. Could this good news give Chancellor Jeremy Hunt a problem? And Labour-run Birmingham City Council has announced it's going bust, freezing all non-statutory spending because, by its own admission, it's running out of cash. It's a year, Alison, since Liz Truss became a short-serving Prime Minister and a year, too, since long-serving Liz, that is, Queen Elizabeth II, left us going off to walk her beloved corgis in the sky. There's so much to discuss. But before we start, what have your tweeted rejoinder, Alison? to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Before we go into that, can I just... I have been laughing. I made you the laughter of despair. I've just been reading about Birmingham City Council. But what I particularly loved, and, and listeners, Planet Normal listeners, might like to come up with some suggestions because the council, Birmingham Council has spent thousands naming streets, things like oh, Diversity yeah. Grove. <laughs> Harmony Street. <laughs> Equality road. You know, so you've got all these armed militias, they're running around Brum, and then suddenly they see that the street's named, you know, Love and Bubbles Avenue, and they put their guns down and they start hugging each other. Black Lives Matter Crescent, you know. I mean, why wouldn't you waste the public money on that? I mean, no, it's absolutely perfect. Anyway, we'll, we'll have perhaps have a discussion about that, but preview of... Se- Can we just establish at the beginning, you did not know what RAC stood for, did you? You didn't know. I thought it was the RAC, so I remember that badge on our car from when I was a child. It's reinforced autoclaved aerated concrete. There was that other one you kept trying to make me learn as well, which was something to do with T-Pip or something. I don't need to trouble myself with these things. I've got you, you know. That's why you're here. So you, I don't need you, to know what a podcast is. I am one. You know uh, exactly. <laughs> That's the original so. Planet Normal quote, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Anyway, coming to this rather interesting small part of my week, really, but quite interesting, was that Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister, tweeted, listen to this, I'm proud of the support I put in place as Chancellor during COVID. From the furlough scheme to the Culture Recovery Fund, we protected millions of jobs and got the economy growing again. Now we just need to halve inflation and stick to our plan. So I responded to that tweet, Liam, slightly wondering what the Prime Minister had to be proud of. And I said, sorry, PM. Lockdown was a historic mistake, racking up a 400 billion debt, which our children's children will still be paying off. Our cities are hollowed out. Millions lost the habit of working and a staggering 5.4 million of working age are on benefits. There's a hospital waiting list of 7.4 million people. Thousands on that list are dying before they can be seen. And one million children and young people are waiting for mental health services. The country is massively poorer and more neurotic. Not they're really is nothing to be proud of. I thought it was interesting because that then clocked up 1.2 million likes, which tells you something, do you think? It does. I think 
anyone who tries to claim credit for what happened during lockdown is on a very sticky wicket. I think there's a lot of sort of silent majority fury out there about lockdown, particularly post the Telegraph's coverage of those WhatsApp messages. And, you know, no mention by Rishi Sunak there, who was Chancellor during lockdown, of course, of the absolutely grotesque spectacle of tens of billions of pounds being extended in loans, a mere one or two percent of which has been recovered. I mean, splurging money on an industrial scale. And when you look back at that and you think now about this cost of living crisis, I think he needs to be careful about putting his hand up and wanting to be given credit for those lockdown years. Absolutely. As you said, Liam, at the top, we come to the latest mess, you know, government digging itself into a hole. We, we know, don't we, Liam, that when the mafia bumps someone off, they bury them in concrete. <laughs> this is really, that's, that's pretty much that's pretty much what's yeah, happening. Concrete, concrete boots. They, they got... Concrete boots. And that really is what's happening to the Tories. I'm a bit divided on this story, really, because in a way... It's both serious and somewhat ridiculous, isn't it? We had Gillian Keegan, the Secretary of State for Education, well, literally putting a foot in the concrete, didn't she? But basically, I think the rule of thumb is that, you know, when you're in a crisis, even if you don't think it's your fault, you really don't say to a reporter, why am I not being thanked for doing an effing good job while everyone else sat on their asses and done nothing? That's rule one, isn't it, of being a Secretary of State. The buck stops with you. So I thought she made a spectacle of herself. And she... What's happening now, Liam, really, you know, we've seen this before, haven't we, in the in in the dying doldrums of the John Major government, is that literally the media are like jackals now. They they sent blood sent blood, don't they? They know the government is probably almost certainly on the way out. And so any slip, any slip now is going to be pounced on. And I know you know a lot about <laughs> whatever it's called, R-A-A-C. I know you know, know a lot about reinforced, autoclaved, aerated concrete. And I, I know you know a lot about it, but, but, the, but the truth is, isn't it, is that this has been the sort of pass the parcel issue that nobody really wanted to solve. It's been going on since the 1990s. It's pretty unfortunate, really, that they've got they've got landed with it at this particular point. But they have. And it is absolutely true, despite his denial that Rishi Sunak as chancellor did slash the number of schools that were going to be rebuilt every year, reducing it to 50. So they are now left holding this steaming chunk of poo. What do you think, co-pilot? A lot of this rack concrete was, of course, used between the 50s and the 80s. A lot of it was used in Essex, by the way, and also some mm. of the new towns. And these kind of areas, they're often kind of swing voter constituencies, blue collar workers, if you like, who can vote in a very pragmatic way going with Tory or Labour. So this could damage the Tories. And it is a little bit unfair to blame this on the Tories, of course, because RAC was used across governments of all shades. And what I'd also say is something that doesn't seem to be getting into any of the coverage is that this Building Schools for the Future programme, I did a lot of work on it back in the day. I made a couple of dispatches documentaries for Channel 4 because a lot of this spending was actually PFI spending on the Never Never, the private finance initiative. And that was under Labour. PFI was invented by the Tories, but it was massively utilised by Labour. Alan Milburn, the health secretary, it's PFI or bust. But the point is that the government was urging the private sector to borrow on its books in order to fund public investments. And the private sector, of course, charged royally for that privilege. And then they charged as part of the deal, the government, huge amounts of money for services that are needed by schools and hospitals and so on. And this came to a point when we found a document, how much to change a light switch in an NHS hospital. And it was £333. <laughs> the private finance initiative company was charging taxpayers, was charging the state. And this is actually a lot of the reason why the Building Schools for the Future programme was reined in because it was absolutely terrible value for money because under Labour, PFI funding was being used rather than 
on the books government borrowing that everybody could understand where the money was coming from. So the real villain here, if you like, is Gordon Brown and those other new Labour uh, cabinet ministers who absolutely insisted on using PFI, even though they knew in their bones, and I talked to them about extensively at the time and wrote about it in the Telegraph extensively, they knew this was terrible value for public money. I think, Liam, what this really is about, you know, apart from all the hoo-ha about you know, Gillian Keegan effing and blinding. And by the way, I do genuinely think Keegan is out of her depth. Absolute madness, utterly unconservative. One of those Lib Dems who somehow infiltrated the senior ranks of the Tory party. And of course, Liam, the government's recommendations for how gender identity should be handled at school have disappeared, kicked, of course, into the long grass. One of the things I was talking about in my Telegraph column this week was we are just beleaguered by short termism. We don't see it's a complete crisis of short termism. The sky now is black with with vultures coming home to roost. I keep thinking, is there a single politician of any party who is concerned about anything beyond the next electoral cycle? And, you know, we've talked about it endlessly here on The Rocket, haven't we? Housing, energy, the NHS, which we can come on to, just absolute short-term fixes, you know, quick plaster over this gaping wound. And we can see them, we can see them doing it now, we can see them doing it with net zero, storing up huge amounts of trouble for the country in the future, but they've got their fingers in their ears. I despair. I think we are now in the run-up to the next general election. I've got a kind of feeling in my bones that it won't be sort of October next year, but it'll be more like May. And now you are getting this sense. We've had a Labour shadow cabinet reshuffle, which we will come on to, Alison. But we are getting this sense that politics now is going into campaigning mode. But we must stay focused on the issues as we always do on Planet Normal. And talking of your column, I I thought it was a really great piece of writing you offered readers in this week's column, Alison. The link to that's in the show notes of this episode. On the NHS, in particular, the comments of the distinguished journalist, Maropi Mills. Yeah, this is an absolutely terrible story, Liam. I'm sure lots of listeners will have heard on Monday morning on the Today programme on Radio 4, Maropi Mills, you know, telling the almost unspeakable story of her daughter, Martha, who was 13 when she had a bike, a cycling accident and was admitted to a specialist pancreatic trauma unit at King's College Hospital London. Martha would have been 16 this week, but she died a wholly avoidable death. That was the that was the verdict of the coroner. And basically, as with the NHS, it was just one damn mistake after the other. But something I was focusing on, really, apart from the fact that this lovely, lovely, amazing child should not be dead, and it's caused her parents and her sister, obviously, untold agony. But Maropi Mills, who is a senior journalist at The Guardian, said she knew that Martha's injury was quite serious, but she had absolute faith in the system. And unfortunately, the family's grateful and trusting, that's uh, Maropi Mills's words, attitude towards the NHS was, of course, going to be utterly betrayed. No surprises to some of us on Planet Normal. And the thing that leapt out at me, Liam, was on the Today programme, there was this wonderful interview with this, obviously, you know, absolute heart-rending interview with a bereaved mother. And then the presenter, Michelle Hussein, When she was introducing Martha's story, this is what she said. If a loved one is in hospital, most of us will have faith they will receive the best possible care. And so we should, because our system is made up of dedicated professionals and the NHS ethos is one that we feel vested in. And it is there for us when we need it. But things do go wrong. And when people die and the deaths are preventable, we need to learn from them. (laughs) I was I was listening at home. I was sort of making tea in the kitchen. And I just absolutely couldn't believe it. How insensitive. There is this, uh, you know, the sort of one of the key anchors of the Today programme telling the listeners that they should have faith in the NHS when a 13 year old girl who should have lived if she had been promptly transferred to the intensive care, was not escalated. Nurses recorded her vital signs. They knew there was something wrong. Doctors wouldn't come and help her. Her tubes were filling with blood, so the bed was soaked. Classic signs 
of sepsis. Even Martha herself, this wonderful 13-year-old girl, knew that maybe, as she said to her mother, she was unfixable. So what... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting quite worked up about it. But it's absolutely those we heart the NHS, those syrupy platitudes that Michelle Hussein was trotting out that do so much to prevent the le legitimate, vital criticism of this failing health service. And, and she was talking this quasi-religious, worshipful tone. And we need reform, Liam. This case, every aspect of this case is just dreadful. It isn't journalism, is it, when reporting about a failure in public services, you feel ideologically compelled to issue an apologia before you do your job. It's, it's madness. The NHS costs so much. It costs £180 billion a year, Alison. How much is that? I'll tell you how much that is. That is 70%, 70% of all income tax paid in this country if we only used income tax to fund our public services. And it just shows how absolutely entrenched the vested interests are that our state broadcaster can barely bring itself to report on a failing. It took, didn't it, it seems, the death of the beloved daughter of a very high-profile journalist in order for the Today programme to bring itself to consider that maybe there should be some kind of reform. Maybe I'm being a little bit lacking in generosity here, but I am sick and tired of our political and media class failing to grasp this problem. We both want the continuation of free at the point of use healthcare. Almost everyone in the country wants the continuation of free at the point of use healthcare. That does not mean we have to go to an American system where people are left bleeding in the street because their credit card has expired or they don't have a credit card. We must have a grown-up conversation about this. And I have huge admiration for Maropi Mills. The way she wrote about it, the dignity with which she wrote about it, knowing that she will have upset a lot of her chums by daring to say something bad about the NHS. My heartfelt condolences go out to her and her family, but also at this very difficult time. Chapeau, Maropi Mills. Chapeau for being a proper journalist. So another thing that leapt out at me, co-pilot, which I could was kind of rubbing my eyes in disbelief because this has hardly been reported on. There is a new energy bill going through Parliament this week, which contains some utterly hair-raising clauses. You're going to love this. It makes the Birmingham City Council, <laughs> Dave Arkell, look like, you know, small fry. So basically, some of these punitive clauses in this bill say that property owners who fail to comply apply with new energy efficiency rules could face prison. The bill creates new criminal offences and increases civil penalties as part of this effort to hit net zero targets. And people who do fall foul of these new regulations to reduce their energy consumption could face up to a year in prison and fines of up to £15,000. Now, looking at some of the offences, Liam, it looks to me like it's going to criminalise a huge percentage of the population, certainly at Pearson Towers, will all be marched off in a black Mariah. So basically, you would be won't be allowed to do your washing until the government <laughs> says it's OK. And you'd be charged twice as much if you dare to run the dishwasher at a non-designated time. Who voted for this, Halligan? Who voted for it? Yeah, can I can I can I just speak up for middle-aged dads, right? Because we get absolutely monstered at home if we don't load up and use the dishwasher. And now we're gonna get carted <laughs> off yes. by the fuzz if we do load up the dishwasher. It'll be it'll be Liam, why haven't you loaded the dishwasher? Cause cause I'm on parole. I'm gonna be taken to jail. But this is I know I mean it is it is at one level it's absolutely hysterical, but as I said, it's just absolutely jaw-dropping. Do you think they've got a taste for this kind of draconian stuff from from lockdown? And I think it surely it betrays a desperation in the political class, almost unanimously committed to really implausible net zero targets. I think it was only 12 Conservative MPs who voted against it. We're hoping to get one of those on the rocket possibly next week. And 
hasn't ULES in London and the expansion of ULES to outer London shown them that there is zero enthusiasm for green measures which penalise ordinary people. So now our parliament, our democratically elected parliament, is sneaking through as if someone hadn't drawn this to my attention. I wouldn't even have known these absolutely astonishing clauses, punitive clauses were there. I mean, it hasn't been on the news, Liam, has it? Barely, but our dishwasher gag means that it now will be on the news. <laughs> Look, I wanted to say something about the, the green debate. The debate is very much in flux, and so these new laws are, are politically very tin -ed. This is not the time to turn the screw and increase the punishments for not following green mantras. This is the case time for a proper debate, because there are very, very good arguments on both sides, and now some of the arguments on the, let's just slow down on this net zero stuff, Let's think more about the cost of it and who actually pays the cost. Those arguments are now coming to the fore. As I wrote in last week's Sunday Telegraph, Alison, there is now a growing concern among the general public about whether or not electric vehicles really are the answer. It's almost certain, I'd bet serious money, that the 2030 ban on the new sales of petrol and diesel cars to be implemented in the UK five years before the EU, before the US, I think that will be pushed back. Four courts, car dealerships here and in the US and across Europe are packed full of EV cars that haven't yet been sold. This is a major problem. And at the same time, just as the war in Ukraine really galvanised the net zero debate and suddenly energy security went from being you know, something that nerds like me talk about to being front page news, the oil price, it's worth saying, is now up at $90 a barrel. It was $70 a barrel roughly at the beginning of July. That's a massive increase. Russia and the Saudis are working together. They're extending cuts that were going to last until October all the way to December. The oil prices jumped up. We've already seen big increases in petrol and diesel prices during August. Some of the sharpest monthly hikes for almost a quarter of a century in the cost of filling up, by the way. And it strikes me that this more sceptical concern about green policies is going to come to the fore even more this autumn and winter, because I do think that energy crunch this winter is probably going to be worse if you look at meteorological forecasts than it was last winter. Well, I'm seriously worried, co-pilot, that we could be looking at blackouts this winter. War in Ukraine is reshaping our world. Since the first week of the war, the Telegraph's team of experts in London and correspondents on the ground have been analysing Putin's invasion every weekday on the Ukraine The Latest podcast. With over 50 million listens and downloads, Ukraine The Latest is the go-to source for up-to-date analysis on the war from every angle, military, humanitarian, political, economic and historical, to name just a few. In each episode, we unpack the past 24 hours of the war, as well as regularly being joined on the pod by our on-the-ground correspondents and guests who take us into their own experiences. Search for Ukraine The Latest in the same place you're listening to this podcast and follow the podcast so you don't miss an episode. John Mills is an economist and entrepreneur, the founder and majority shareholder of the JML Consumer Products Empire which carries out direct-to-consumer marketing through major retail stores and its ubiquitous shopping channels. John's business success has been combined with a life in politics. He was a Labour councillor in London over a period spanning 30 years and has contested both European and Westminster parliamentary seats for Labour. John's economics training and experience in business led him to believe the UK should leave the European Union. He was, in fact, the chairman of the Vote Leave campaign group. He's also been deputy chair of the London Docklands Corporation and, at various points, the biggest individual donor to the Labour Party. John, tell me, tell Planet Normal listeners about your relationship with the Labour Party. Well, I've been a member of the Labour Party for many, many years, 60 years now. And I've always supported the idea of having a strong left of centre opposition to the uh, Conservative government. That's what we have. I'd very much like to see a Labour government elected next year. I think that Keir Starmer's done a pretty good job of putting the party together. But I do think there are some gaps right across the spectrum, actually, not just the Labour Party, 
but the uh, Conservative Party as well, and Lib Dems, as to what to do to get the economy to grow. And that's my major sort of focus at the moment. What's it like being a really, really successful businessman and JML, your kind of broadcasting, retailing empire, globally selling tens of thousands of goods every single day? What's it like being so successful in business, but also being a Labour supporter? Do people say, how does that work? They do from time to time, but I don't think there's really a problem there. I think there's a settled view now that what we need is a mixed economy with a successful private sector complemented by a, a well-run public sector, and that's where I am. You're a very prolific author. You write many, many pamphlets on economic issues, which I know are widely read across the media in Whitehall and indeed in Westminster. What's your assessment at the moment of what needs to happen to get the British economy back on track? Because there's been a feeling for a long time now, not least since the global financial crisis in 2008-9, but also since COVID, we're meant to be in the middle of a sort of V-shaped recovery, a bounce back. But since lockdown, it seems to me we haven't really got out of second gear. No, I think that's correct. And I think there's a good reason for that, which is that any economy needs to have a competitive export sector to enable it to have the freedom to grow and to make investment attractive. And we just haven't had that. We've had an exchange rate which has been too high for a long period of time. We've lost share of world trade. As a result of this, our investment has flagged and is still flagging. We can't stimulate the economy through fiscal and monetary policies because we've run into balance of payments, difficulties and inflationary problems and too much borrowing. And I think that until the economy is readjusted so that we have a more competitive exchange rate, we'll never get the economy to grow. That's the really crucial problem facing us right across the political spectrum. How about Brexit as well? Again, quite unusually for such a high profile Labour donor, you were also the chairman of Vote Leave, a very prominent Brexiteer. How do you think Brexit's going? What would you be doing differently if you were in power? I don't think actually Brexit has made a massive difference. I think it's often talked up by Remainers as being the main reason why we've got economic difficulties at the moment, but I don't think that's really correct. I think it's made, had negative effects in some respects, but one of the things it did do is to bring the exchange rate down, which probably means that the performance of the economy is better than it otherwise would have been. So I think Brexit has probably up to now had a, a, a relatively small but negative effect on what's been happening. And what did you think of the news just last week, John, the shock news that UK GDP, the size of our economy, growth of the economy has actually been far, far better over the last couple of years than the Office for National Statistics originally thought. They seem to have found a lot more growth behind the back of the sofa. So far from being one of the most sluggish economies coming out of lockdown, the UK has actually been one of the most fast growing Did you feel in your bones that that was the case? Or were you surprised when you saw these new ONS revisions? I was quite surprised by that, I must say, because all the sentiment in the market has been pretty negative. Retail sales have been very sluggish. All these signs of the economy not doing very well have been there. Investments have been low. So I was surprised to see this adjustment. You know, I welcome the fact that it's happened, but I was surprised to see it occurring. How does this happen? It's really confusing to non-economists. How can that ONS possibly get it so wrong and then come out with corrections, if you like, or revisions, so we say more generously, of literally tens of billions of pounds of growth that they didn't know were there? I agree. I think it is extraordinary. There are all sorts of difficulties about tracking the growth and making sure you get the numbers right. And the ONS has revisions quite frequently. But this is a very big one. And I must say, I think it's... Uh, doesn't make running policy any easier if you get very big inflations like this taking place. Back in the 70s and into the 80s, of course, Britain was called the sick man of Europe. And then in the late 90s, Germany was the sick man of Europe. It seems Germany, Europe's economic powerhouse, has that sick man crown again. Our economic fortunes are tied up to some extent with the EU, as you and I both agree as people who voted leave, but we've never denied that. We want a strong German economy. We want to trade with the EU as much as we can, as well as with the rest of the world. How worried should we be that the economic news out of Germany seems to be so bad? Well, I think we should be worried. I mean, I I think there's a really major problem 
involving not only uh, the UK and Germany, but pretty well the whole of the Western world, which is that we are growing very slowly compared to lots of the Far East, particularly China, but now many other economies, Vietnam, Malaysia, and we're just dropping further and further behind. And the astonishing figure is between 1980 and 2020, the uh, Chinese economy grew by 30-something times what it had been in the start of the period, whereas the rest of the West as a whole roughly doubled. I mean, that makes an absolutely massive difference to the soft and hard power relative across the world. And I think we're still drifting in the same direction. I wanted to get your thoughts on the trade deals that Britain has signed since Brexit. Of course, some of the deals have been just rollovers of the deals we have had with the EU, but other deals have been brand new deals, particularly the CPTPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, linking us up with big economies around the Pacific Basin. How important are these big trade deals, John, do you think, in order to secure Britain's prosperity? Well, unfortunately, I don't think they're all that great. I think that uh, you've got to realise that any trade deal involves not only more, more opportunities for British exporters, but more opportunity for importers and for factories in other countries to sell to us. And if you look at the net benefits that come in from these trade deals, they really are pretty small. I think they are very small in relation to what they would be if they were secured in a different direction by doing something on the exchange rate, which has been the main issue which I've been concentrating on for a, a long period of time. That's where the big numbers might be secured, not really, I think, on trade deals. As a Labour man, John, to your fingertips, how excited are you at Keir Starmer's lead in the polls? Do you think Labour are going to win? Do you think they're going to secure a big majority? I think Labour's almost certain to be the largest party, hopefully to be uh, a majority party over all others, although I don't think that could be uh, certain. How much difference will the Labour government make? I think it will make a reasonable difference, but not a huge amount. I mean, I think the problem at the moment is that uh, all the political parties in this country are, are pretty well blocked in by the fact that the economy is growing so slowly and the range of choices that people have got are pretty narrow. So I don't think it's going to make a revolutionary difference, but I think it'll be a competent government. I think it'll do some good things, but I don't think it's going to change the world. You've been around at the top of the Labour Party for quite a long time, John, if I may say so. You saw absolutely firsthand the creation of new Labour under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, their rise to power. How does Keir Starmer measure up to Tony Blair? Well, he's a different person from Tony Blair, but I think he's very competent. I think he's very solid. I think that he'll run a, a pretty clean regime when, it, when it's in power. I think it will be seen as pretty competent. Uh, I think the dangers come on low economic growth, as I said before, which I think are going to constrain what it can do. But I think there's a reasonable chance that it will be a successful government. But there isn't the same feeling in the country, is there, as there was in the mid to late 90s as Tony Blair came to power. A lot of people who were swing voters or traditional conservative voters, they actively voted for Tony Blair. There aren't signs that they're going to vote for Keir Starmer. They might end up voting Labour, but because they're not voting Tory. There is a difference, isn't there? Yeah, I think there is a difference. And I think this affects uh, the political spectrum right across the piece uh, that uh, politicians reputations have slid down over the last 10 or 15 years because we haven't been doing terribly well. And I think this is going to make life in some ways more difficult for the next Labour government. But I still think that every chance with the shadow cabinet we've got, which looks pretty strong to me, that we'll have a really competent government which should do a reasonable job. But what does it say that Blair himself and his famous advisor, Peter Mandelson, who of course is a former cabinet minister himself, have now emerged from the shadows and openly advising Keir Starmer. Is that healthy in politics, to have politicians who were on the front line 20-odd years ago when they came to power advising today's generation of politicians? Well, I think that uh, you should get advice wherever you can, as long as it's good advice. And, and I think that uh, some of the Labour leadership of previous administrations are still around and got uh, much to contribute. Keir Starmer's rise to have a broad approach here, a big tent, and uh, I welcome the fact that's the case. 
What is your advice to Keir Starmer? What is your advice as a noted, very successful, very widely respected business leader to Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves? What aspects of Labour's programme, particularly their economic programme, could do with improvement? Well, my advice would be go for a manufacturing revival. Go for all the uh, conventional wisdom around the supply side with more education and training, more infrastructure expenditure, more R&D, more patient capital, all of that, and bury in that a uh, range of the policies, a reduction in the exchange rate, which is what will really make the difference and get the economy growing again. And I think a broad sweep approach like that, centering on manufacturing to get our trading situation back under control again, would be the best way ahead. And I think that's a saleable programme which could transform the prospects for the Labour Party, but also for the country as a whole. I know you keep a very close eye on the manufacturing sector. You and I have talked about it a lot over the years. You'll have seen in the recent numbers from the Society of Motor Manufacturing and Traders that now two-fifths of cars made in the UK are electric vehicles or hybrids. That's up from just a tenth two years ago. A lot of these cars aren't being sold. A lot of these cars are having to be heavily discounted. Do you think, John, in all honesty, that 2030 ban on sales of new petrol and diesel vehicles in the UK, a deadline which is much earlier than the EU and elsewhere, do you think that ban will actually stick or do you think that deadline will be shifted back? Well, I think it is going to be difficult. I mean, I think the whole car industry is in in really sticky shape at the moment. I mean, clearly we've got a battery problem which is going to be quite difficult to solve. A lack of facilities to build these batteries for the EVs, so-called gigafactories. No, I think that, well, that's a problem. But I mean, that's to some extent symptomatic of what's happening right across industry. And this is one of the reasons why I think that doing something about having a manufacturing revival or campaigning for that is the best way ahead. I mean, I can't see how we're going to have a reasonably prosperous future unless we can get manufacturing back from being left at less than 10% of GDP now to something like 15%. And that's a big change. But it's one which... But we're betting our whole car industry. I say our car industry because, of course, Britain's biggest car makers are foreign car makers based in Britain. <laughs> we, we, we know that. We're bet, betting the ranch, if you like, of a sector in the UK that employs getting on for a million people directly and indirectly, drives 10% of exports, as you know well. The whole of that is being bet on the notion that electric vehicles are the right technology. Are they, John? Are they? Well, I mean, if you're going to go for net zero, they probably are, but there are all sorts of difficulties about uh, getting the transfer over to electric vehicles. I mean, there's the charging issue, there's the distribution of power issue, there's the battery issue, there's uh, the issue around uh, microprocessors. It's It's a big, big step to take to ban the uh, reduction of vehicles by 2030 that aren't electric. And uh, I I think from a climate change point of view, it makes sense. Whether it's going to be practical politics, I'm not so sure. And you'll know as a business leader, albeit a business leader with very, very strong links to the Labour Party, you'll know that when politicians and officials and bureaucrats try and predict what the best technology is going to be, it often doesn't work. Just look at the EU making sure that we all had to buy compact fluorescent light bulbs <laughs> 10, 15 years ago, and then we all bought them. Then suddenly LED became available and commercially viable, and we had to throw all those fluorescent light bulbs away. I've got a drawer full of them at home. Is it really right that politicians and bureaucrats are telling us not just to move to EVs, but compelling us to do so. It's compulsory. Is that the right way to run an economy with officials trying to steer the market and technology in such a massive sector? Well, I think there are big risks about doing that. And this is why I think that having a more market-based approach, uh, using the exchange rate to make investment more profitable, is a better way in general about uh, uh, deciding which sort of technologies to go for. I think the record of the market in stuffing out uh, technologies that aren't going to work, maximising up the ones that do, is better than by and large the state approach of trying to pick winners. And that's the way we ought to go. But I'm not sure that that's the way that politicians in this country are looking at it.
Finally, what did you think of Rishi Sunak's decision as a business leader, as somebody that thinks deeply about energy policy, geopolitics? What did you think about his decision to allow new drilling in the North Sea? Because he was pilloried by the Labour Party for that. Well, again, these are difficult choices. Obviously, it's a strong case for not having more drilling and more hydrocarbon exploration and, and exploitation if you're going to go for net zero. On the other hand, you've got to get from where we are now to there without the economy tanking along the way. And that does involve very difficult decisions and trade-offs like the one over North Sea oil. Whatever decision you take, half the population is going to say it's the wrong one. What would you have advised, though, if Keir Starmer asked you, John, you're a Labour man, I trust you through and through, I know you want what's best for the Labour Party and indeed for the country, but what would you have said to him? Isn't it the right thing, given that we're going to be using oil and gas till even 2050? Even the Climate Change Committee, the government's own watchdog, acknowledges that. Wasn't it the right thing to allow those drilling licences? I think, on balance, possibly it may have been. I think also that uh, fracking is probably an opportunity which uh, I'd be more keen on taking up than a lot of other people in the Labour Party seem to be. You know, I think we've just got to recognise the fact that we've got to have enough energy to get through the next few years. Shifting to energy sources such as gas, which produce less CO2, is a better bet than uh, than trying to rely either on just on renewables, which are too intermittent, or coal, which is much worse, or other hydrocarbons, which are worse than, than gas. John Mills, absolutely great to talk to you. Thanks so much for appearing on Planet Normal. Thank you very much, Liam. Really enjoyed it. So there you go, Alison. John Mills, a Labour man to his fingertips, but he's pro-fracking, he's pro-more drilling in the North Sea. Maybe it's because that he knows, in the way that the kind of usual Islington Labour types don't, that the GMB union and a lot of the Red Wall Labour seats are in favour of those things. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. I, I was sort of only very dimly aware of him, but what a kind of impressive and sensible guy, isn't he? And it made me think slightly differently about Labour, which, you know, which which may be all, all to the good. And the fact that he was chair of a leave, well, impressive because, of course, one of the speculations arising from this week's reshuffle by Starmer is that they're moving into place more Remainers and that that signals that there could be a Labour government, which we can probably expect, certainly from about the middle of 2024, would would be trying to rejoin the EU. But it doesn't sound like John Mills would have any truck with that at all. And he would be he would be um, bankrolling a lot of it. I do think that the reshuffle was was very intriguing, Liam. It was a very firm statement of intent, wasn't it, by Starmer, really moving these very centrist Blairite people. Liz Kendall, who I like very much, she's gone from a shadow health role to the work and pensions brief. And I think she's spoken about the need to take a look at benefits. So the prospect of reform there, Hilary Benn, of course, and Pat McFadden who is another a Labour right? The only sort of socialist firebrand who's getting a look in is An Angela Rayna, who is, uh, people have pointed out, she's basically John Prescott in a dress, isn't she, Ange? <laughs> she's... I think that's right. What, what's happening is that the Starmer's Labour Party is rolling out now the new Labour campaign book. This is directly from the period of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. Crikey, Blair and Labour's then election supremo Peter mm. Mandelson have emerged uh, from the shadows and are openly advising Starmer's Labour Party. As you say, lots of Blairite, New Labour era people have come back. Liz Kendall, Hillary Benn as Northern Ireland Secretary. You've got David Lammy, a Foreign Secretary. Interestingly, Pat McFadden, a very smart guy. Mm. I've known it for a long time. He was a big part of New Labour's policy operation in number 10. He's also got a promotion. A big demotion for Lisa Nandy, who she was levelling up secretary, but Big Ange has now taken that <laughs> in the same way as you say, John Prescott became deputy prime minister and all his integrated transport policy stuff. He had a, a huge brief. Angela Rayner's got that too in order to keep the left quiet in the run-up to this election but Lisa Nandy's demotion is I think dangerous I do think she's a very effective communicator she was for me 
the only candidate during that Labour leadership election who actually shone, who who did themselves credit during that campaign. She is seen to be on the soft left of the party. The people around Starmer are wary of her because she is a plausible alternative, in my view. But this really is, as we said earlier, the firing of the starting gun for the general election campaign. This is probably the Labour shadow cabinet that they're going to go into that next election campaign with. You've got some retreads, you know, Ed Miliband still kicking around uh, uh, energy. I wonder what he's going to make of John Mills's comments on fracking and North Sea drilling. Yvette Cooper, very, very experienced. Of course, Yvette Cooper was a cabinet minister in her own right during the Brown government. Very experienced politician. So they're trying to put their best foot forward. They're shooing away, apart from Angela Rayner, as we said, the more awkward left wing types. They're basically telling the backbenchers to shut up and not ruin it, to not frighten the horses, mm. to keep Middle England on side, if you like. And I have to say, you know, a lot of the people in the, this shadow cabinet, they're pretty reasonable, competent people apart from ed the wind is always blowing somewhere Billy Band, when he was challenged as to how his forests of wind farms were going to generate enough energy to keep the grid going you know what leapt out at me co-pilot this actually made me smile this is the party this is labor which has a go at asian and black people on the tory benches we know we've got three people at least three people now from ethnic minorities in well even more now because claire cotino hasn't has she's gone she's she's gone in as well so you've got sort of basically four asian or black people in the among the most senior positions in the cabinet starmer has not done anything for diversity really at all so you've got lammy you've got thangam debonair and there's one other woman the superbly named thangam debonair who's a pretty handy cellist by the way i've seen a Fab fabulous name but really <laughs> This is a very notably, a notably white cabinet. And you can imagine, can't you, Halligan, if it was the other way around, this lot would be saying something, but no one said a peep about it. And it just did make me smile because I thought he really doesn't want to frighten the horses, does he? And I think behind him on the Labour benches are some notably useless hires. So he's trying to keep them well away, isn't he? As you say, not to alarm people before the election. I mean, I think Angela Rayne is interesting because... The prospect of her being deputy prime minister and possibly Starmer going under a bus pushed by Ange herself would would uh, I would I would find it quite frightening. But she's interesting because she presents as absolutely solid red wall, doesn't she? But remember that notorious photograph, which I think we will see wheeled out during the election of her and Starmer taking the knee. Angela talks the gobby northern talk, but actually uh, she doesn't have work class attitudes anymore she has absorbed the very much the metropolitan liberal elite you know can't say what a woman is type of person so i think she's a mixed bag i think she is the loose cannon i'd rather have seen lisa nandy who i rate a lot more highly than angela rayner but angela is starmer's bit of rough just as john prescott was tony blair's do you remember when prescott punch someone Liam and and Blair just said oh John is John John is John, John is John <laughs> <laughs> so they like to have a bit of color but really it's quite an interesting all white farrow and ball shades of white palette really in this cabinet and as I said if it was if it was the conservatives with they would be oh it's not very diverse is it you know it's racist I wonder where Craig Evans is the man that John Prescott punched <laughs> if you're listening Craig do get in touch. Trust you to remember the name. Your tr the Halligan trivia brain is a is world class, isn't it? World class. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We love to read your thoughts. We learn so much from you, the citizens of Planet Normal. This is from Gordon, beloved Planet Normal stalwart and a Scottish conservative, that uh, doughty but benighted breed. Gordon says, 
It's a great episode, guys. I hadn't heard about the Reverend Richard Fothergill. I've just withdrawn £10,000 from the Yorkshire Building Society and told all my friends. Be careful if you answer any customer surveys with the wrong answers. That's enough to get you cancelled. Well, says Gordon, I have cancelled Yorkshire Building Society, as this can work both ways. And here, Liam, as this is um, Gordon shared with us his letter to the Building Society... I have just withdrawn £10,000 from my account. You have acted terribly. In what world is it wrong to state a perfectly legal and commonly held belief? He did nothing wrong. Merely suggested that you concentrate on your core work and not Pride Month. The Reverend showed no disrespect to anyone and didn't discriminate in any way. He simply answered your question about what he thought. Thinking is now illegal, as we know, Halligan. And and Emily says, Emily's responding to my column about the tragic death of, of young Martha Mills. I hope that Martha's parents are successful in their campaign to get a Martha's rule, giving relatives the right to a second opinion, says Emily. I've had to fight very hard for my daughter over the years. So many medics wrote me off as a white middle class entitled fusspot, but we got there in the end. I remember one night on the ward asking to see a doctor on my daughter's behalf, being told to be quiet by a dismissive nurse. I said I would scream the place down unless they got me a doctor for my daughter. And they did. And it was the right thing to do. But they treated me like a dangerous animal from that time on. We're all trained to be nice and to respect and believe the doctors in our NHS. But I would say to all those parents out there who think there's something wrong and they're being dismissed. Don't be afraid to scream the damn place down if you have to. And don't be nice or want to be liked or try not to make a fuss. I hope that Martha's incredibly brave parents, she was so lucky to have them and their love, succeed so that no one else loses a child in such circumstances ever again. Absolutely right, Emily. I'm telling everybody I meet, don't hesitate now, because if you don't care about yourself or your loved ones, the NHS will certainly not care about you. Very powerful stuff. Let's just lighten the mood a little, because... It's not the beginning of a new season of Planet Normal until we've had a poem from our resident bard, Bob, not his real name. Dear Planet Normal, the other day I was reading an article about Sadiq Khan's exciting plans for our planet's future when I nodded off and had a dream, says Bob. After waking up, I pieced together the bits I could remember into another dreadful poem. We love your poems. We love your poems. I'd intended to write even more lines, but I was interrupted by a nuisance phone call from somebody in Porlock. That's the place with the really steep hill, isn't it, where it is, yes. old-fashioned cars used to go up it in reverse. I cycled up there once. Anyway, thanks again for Planet Normal. You are the dream team of podcasting. Regards, Bob, former mug winner. I oh, don't send me another of those blinking <laughs> mugs. So, Sadiq Khan, with apologies to Samuel Taylor Coleridge. In London town, did Sadiq Khan a Eula zone decree and denounce us cranks and nutters, all those who disagreed? And how the common people cheered his eco friendly plan, particularly the ones he'd forced to scrap their car or van. <laughs> now, some may claim that this was just a money-grabbing whim. But Sadiq's a man who follows science so long <laughs> as it follows him. <laughs> and his lust for power has led him to become a major player. He's the chairman of C40, the global gang of mayors. They're kindly planned our future without cars or planes or meat. And they jet around the planet to discuss it with the elite. So Khan and his chums will rule our lives, of that there is no doubt, unless Londoners come to their senses and finally vote him out. Boom, boom. Oh. He's good, isn't he? He's good. He's, he's the, the, the meter, <laughs> the grasp of Coleridge's meter. I mean, you know, as a former, <laughs> as, a, as a, a resting English student, I take my hat off to you, Bob. And this is from Michael. Dear Alison and Liam, there are uncanny parallels between the COVID pandemic lockdowns and the ULES expansion to the outer London boroughs. Imperial college models of extreme scenarios presented as reality, dodgy data used in claims and presentations by Sage and the Mayor Sadiq Khan, no proper risk analysis and scenario planning to consider the widespread collateral harm that the restrictions in both situations might cause in comparison to the small gains that might be possible. Finally, a flake 
flagrant disregard for the real human hardship that the policies cause, especially on the poorest in the UK and outer London. How sad, as is most of what is happening at present in this wonderful country of ours. Nevertheless, we do have you and Planet Normal to cheer us up and give us hope that Hooray! in time things will get back on track. We must keep on fighting for what is right. You are our standard bearers. We are with you. Thank you says Michael. Well, thank you, Michael, for a great email. I completely agree about the dodgy dossiers of Imperial College. This is from Tom. So sorry about poor Martha and her family. Another awful story about the National Health Service. My partner is Portuguese. Whenever she or our son need non-urgent medical attention on a flight to Portugal, they go. Hmm. So that is it from Planet Normal for another week. As we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views, email of the week, Alison. Yes, it's a bit of a photo finish, but uh, the, the cherished Planet Normal mug uh, this week will go to Michael for his excellent email on his alma mater, Imperial College. Michael, if you're listening, uh, please uh, send us your full details and your address and the marvellous mug will be winging its way towards you. And in that email, Michael, put in the subject heading mug winner. Alison, before we go, a quick cat update. <laughs> the, 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 the Turkish pussy, as Mrs. Slocum so, so nearly said. Yeah, Turkish pussy is in uh, highly expensive foster care. Be, be, cheaper to go on, be cheaper to go on a Turkish holiday. Pearson Towers is, is meanwhile being remortgaged to the hilt. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely being remortgaged. So if you enjoy Planet Normal, do leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back in interview thanks as ever to our producers isabel bouchard elliot lampitt cass ho and louisa wells stay safe and in touch with us and with each other until next week it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from him <laughs>